Well, welcome everybody. I want to thank you for taking your time out on what's a very nice evening. It's been so cold here recently. Um, a couple people I want to introduce. Uh, Chief Burns. Uh, if you guys have not met Chief Burns, please, please do so. Uh, Director of Parks and Recreation, Derek Rogers. And Assistant Director of Utilities, Melinda Harder. And so uh, we're all here, and uh, Lee Ice is here, Assistant Director of Parks and Rec, also to maybe help answer some questions as this goes through. Um, my intent is to make this somewhat informal, because um, I'm sure that there's specific questions to many of you. Um, and I want to kind of go through where we started and how we've gotten to this point, because some people don't have an understanding of how we've ended up uh, here and at this point in time. So I kind of want to go through that. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the facility, uh, where we're at in that planning process, uh, what is planned for that process, and then also the parks aspect and uh, what, what we intend to do there. So. Uh, I did give you all a handout um, to kind of understand some of the history of this. This started in 2011 when the city approved a needs assessment. Uh, needs assessment showed that we needed about 100,000 square feet of space of use. Uh, to understand that completely, uh, we have about 20,000 or so of usable space in the ITC. Um, and then about 2,000 where patrol is, plus about another 10 or so thousand that we share with the county for different things. So, Quite a, bit, quite a bit of uh, variance of what we, what we need and what we actually have. Uh, so in 2012, we did a study session um, and showed that the building would cost approximately $29 million or so. Uh, over the next couple of years, working with the city commission, that actually pared down a little bit. Uh, we were asked by the city commission to see what we could do to, to reduce that budget. Uh, we were able to pare it down to around 80,000 square feet, but one of the problems with that was that it was not gonna meet the needs for the police department 20 years in the future. So we were building, potentially, almost a building that we would be out of very shortly or we would have to add on to that particular space, just by the space of it. Uh, so if you, if you may recall, if you haven't been here, uh, in 2014 there was a uh, sales tax referendum and uh, it failed uh, at, at that time. And some of the feedback that we got at that time, some of the biggest feedback was uh, didn't like the sales ta tax measure and then the other one was really wanted city-owned property. So, uh, if you recall, Hallmark uh, Properties was being uh, asked to buy for about, I think it was $2 million or $2.5 million. Uh, some of the biggest feedback we got was it really needed to be on city property. So as we move fast forward a little bit, um, in around 2016, 2017, uh, we were approved to do, excuse me, to have $1.5 million for architecture and design. But there was no place necessarily to put it, just the fact that we needed to look and, and design that facility. Uh, last year, that was 2017, excuse me, CIP. Uh, last year we went um, in front of the commission then for the 2018-2019 CIP uh, for $17 million to build phase one. And we're going to talk a little bit about that one today because we talked about $29.5 million and we're going to get to about $18.5 million when you combine architectural services. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what's going to go, go in that. And then last year uh, there was a site selection process um, to kind of understand some of the history of site selection, when this was done in 2011, 2012, I believe 17 sites were originally studied. The number one overall site was uh, KU property. Uh, they're at Bob Billings and Castle. Uh, we had conversations with KU, um, and KU said that they had other plans for that, that specific plan. Uh, the number two overall site is the site that we'll be talking about today, which is the 5100 Overland Drive. Now, ultimately, uh, a private site was, was chosen at that time, and I think it was more location-based than anything, and that there was a feeling that it was a good price for the amount of land and potentially other things that could go on that land. Uh, but ultimately, that, that was one of the issues that people had, is that there, there was a, a solid site or some potential solid sites for the city. So uh, as we came back to the commission last year, uh, we looked at uh, the sites that we looked at before, and we examined all the city-owned sites. And basically what we came down to is um, most of them were either occupied, they, were, they already had existing parks, existing city functions, um, they had to be a certain size, uh, and then so many of them were also outside the primary city limits. So we own future park space considerably outside the city limits, which doesn't really function well for a police department. We also looked at Venture Park, in the, uh, which was in the original needs assessment study, and that particular portion of Venture Park had then been sold, I believe it was in the band trust agreement. So that particular section was also not available. This section also allowed for some different things. There's more arterial streets here. You have 6th Street, you have Wakarusa Street, you have Castle, you can get down to Iowa quickly. 
Additionally, uh, you can get on the K-10, you can get on the I-70, which maybe those things may be used in, for emergency purposes. I don't know that they'd be used as the primary source all the time, but certainly for emergency purposes. It's also right next to the uh, ITC, or about a mile down the road from the ITC, which is our investigations and training center. And as we talk about this being a phased approach, the entire police department's not gonna be there uh, at one time. So being considerably closer to the ITC uh, is, is very important as we kind of go forward. So if you kind of look at, uh, at phase two, it talks about the, a little bit about what we were just talking about as far as um, where, where the proposed police site could be. The drawing that you're seeing is just a concept drawing. Uh, we hired Wilson Esses and Trader Architects to do the original needs assessment. And so this is not where the particular police facility site is going to go necessarily. Uh, when we went, met with the city commission, they uh, said that we could use approximately 16, 16 and a half acres of the 29 and a half acres. Uh, and that the remaining would be for parks. And we'll get uh, Director Rogers to talk about parks here a little bit. Uh, the development costs were also one of, one of the lowest in the city. I know that I uh, had uh, questions about that before. Because so much development is around here, uh, a lot of the fiber, a lot of the water, those things are, are already laid out. So uh, the third page of that is what we're looking at for phase one and phase two. And the first column that you see is what we uh, really would like to get in phase one immediately. And, uh, as you see, uh, the chief could maybe talk about it sometime, the importance of getting the, um, the officers and detectives back together. That's part of how you sell, sell, solve crime. Uh, you talking to each other and, and, and learning about what's going on in the different investigations or, or out on the street. Uh, there's, other, there's also several other things there that you see in phase one. And the reason that um, you don't see those definitively in there is because we do have a set amount of budget. Uh, and we don't know what phase one can include yet, meaning uh, Ms. Harger will talk a little bit about the construction method that we're probably going to propose to build and the reason uh, why you see some different uh, categories in phase one and phase two. What you see in phase two is, is basically the training center side of it. That's what's still uh, planned to be at 4820 Bob Billings Parkway. Uh, and so we talked a little bit about, you see the site drawing, that isn't an exact line as well. We, as we hire architects, as we do site surveys, uh, Director Rogers, the police department, the city, the community will look at uh, where, the, where the, the best location for the site is. Most likely from what we know, that would be on the southern end of that, but it's not definitive because not everything has been uh, looked at. But I want to let Director Rogers talk about the potential of a park a little bit uh, there. Okay. Um, hopefully you guys have any questions and we can ask a little later. But the 29 acres would be I think what we can do when we design, when maybe the police department figures out the design, we can share some of the expense by planning the park and the police station at the same time to try to get a better laid out and a more flowing uh, park system with the building and parking lots. Uh, and this is just me speculating, but looking at the possibilities, uh, I know one of the concerns that I saw was uh, traffic around Eisenhower. And I look at the traffic issues that go on around Free State High School now and what are what are and what could be the possibilities of helping to resolve some of that and alleviate some of those traffic problems if there's a possibility of having a an opening into Walker Rusa Drive a little bit farther to the east and then maybe that would open up possibilities for parking in Free State. I'm just brainstorming that, but I think there might be a, a way that we can alleviate two problems at the same time. One is parking in Free State when they have sporting events and then with parking and the police department and traffic concerns that the neighborhood may have with um, the police station being where it is. As it comes to developing the park, the feedback I've gotten is people like the idea of, of running. They don't want to run on asphalt. A lot of runners like to run on uh, material that is kind of like fine what you'll find on the, the levee. Um, possibly doing some of that and still have an ADA. Uh, when it comes to designing, the park, I'll be looking for a lot of uh, input from the community and what the community would like to see. Um, comments I usually hear is, well, you have Rock Chalk Park right next door. I also look at all the apartments and all the houses that are built around here, and you don't really have a lot available uh, when it comes to outdoor parks other than the Rock Chalk. So um, that'll be looking for input. So I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Harger to kind of talk about uh, the building process and potentially what we'd be asking for the City Commission for in the future and why you see some things that maybe don't uh, follow the commission. 
All right, so the first thing we're going to do um, next week, we're going to the, the uh, City Commission with alternative project uh, delivery procedures. This is something that we started the end of last year, and the city has used uh, alternative delivery methods like design build, um, um, construction manager at risk, <coughs> on projects such as uh, pump stations and on the library that was a construction manager project. It opens up some other opportunities to get the contractor involved during design, which I'll go into why that would be important for this. But what we found was when the charter ordinance for the city was written back in 1984, the use of design build and construction manager at risk, it wasn't real popular. And so it never explicitly said how we would go about doing those types of projects. So we're following you know, the trends. This has been going on for 10, 20 years um, and seeing good results with projects. But we really wanted to, our city manager really wanted to make sure that this was something that the commission looked at, you know, how do we do this properly? Because um, any project delivery method can be successful, but you've got to make sure that um, it's implemented in the right way. So, so we're presenting those procedures to the city commission next Tuesday. Um, the, the charter ordinance, if, if those are approved, would go into effect May 3rd, which is about 60 days after the second reading of the ordinance. Um, which was back on March 3rd and then two weeks later um, we will go to the City Commission and request to use construction manager at risk for the police facility project um, originally we were talking both design build and uh, construction manager at risk and mentioning those at Commission meetings um, but as we continue to look at what this project would need it looks like the construction man manager at risk um, option provides the best benefit, the best value for the city. Um, so that's the recommendation we're going to make to the commission, but it ultimately is up to the commission to decide whether they want to go that route, um, to use alternative delivery, or whether they want to go with a traditional design bid build. Um, so design either way with this um, would begin probably August. The thought is that after the city commission decides in May which route they want to go, uh, the first step is to get a design consultant on board. So we look at uh, qualifications when selecting design services. Um, that's not a low bid thing when you're looking at professional services. So we look at all the, the qualifications and the team that they would present and what kind of experience they've had on these types of projects. Um, so we would be sending out an RFP for those services in May and hope to receive those proposals back in June and then there is some detailed um, you know, procedures on how we go through a selection committee to review those proposals. There's typically interviews afterwards and so it's going to take a couple months to get through that process and hopefully award in July to a design consultant. That design consultant uh, would be able to either design for a traditional design bid build uh, delivery project or they could um, be the designer on a construction manager at risk project, meaning that they're they're there doing the design, and we're we just have this um, other contract with a construction manager to provide insight on construction methods, um, cost estimates, give feedback on you know alternatives. We can look at this, we can look at that. How can we get the most value um, for your price tag? And so they're involved during design, and then they get to a certain point in the design where they can put together a guaranteed max price. So if that's the route that we go with construction manager at risk, we'd be looking at uh, getting proposals from a construction manager, which would include fee as a component of that competition. Um, it would be a competitive selection process, just like we do with um, design consultants. Um, but they would be looking at qualifications and experience and the team and all of that in addition to uh, just the fee. So we would look at doing that in July and August and so really bring them on board right after the designer so as the design consultant gets started um, on the process that you have that contractor input from the beginning. Um, if we didn't go that route then we would just have the design consultant on board for about a year it would take to get through the planning submittals which I'll mention um, you know get to a bid document set that then goes out to bid typically four to six weeks you receive bids back, you know, you, you hope they're under your budget, and then you're good to go with your project. Um, so design, we're looking at about a year either way. Um, during that year of design, we'd be going through a rezoning. So right now, the entire 29 acres is zoned open space. Um, as Captain Garcia mentioned, we're looking at 
<coughs> excuse me, about 16 acres for the police facility based on the needs assessment, and so that would leave about 13 acres for the park. Um, <coughs> so we would look at a site plan and how everything would be laid out, and then we would uh, go through a process to split into two parcels and rezone the two parcels. So you would still have uh, a parcel that is zoned open space for the park, and then the other one would be zoned for a use that allows the police facility, um, GPI. So uh, then we'll go through a platting process. That property has not been platted. And um, the site plan on this requires a special use permit, so we would go through that. It's basically um, just a very detailed site plan. Um, so once all of that has uh, taken place, that usually takes anywhere from three to six months. Um, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities for public input during those processes. You'll see signs up at the property letting you know when meetings are being held for, for public input. Um, then we would um, be on board to be able to get started with um, building permits and things like that. The, if we have the construction manager on board, uh, typically you can start construction sooner. Um, you're eliminating that, that four to six weeks of an open bid period where there's questions from contractors and responses and they, they typically put things out in bid packages. So we would still have competitive bids on subcontracted work. They, if they want to self-perform the work, they have to submit a bid as well. Um, but that goes out in bid packages, and you can start on your site work ahead of final building design being complete and final building permits. So um, you could look at, you know, possibly as early as February or March to start seeing some movement on the site if there is a construction manager. Um, so there's some, there's some savings in the schedule that way, which ultimately results in some savings in costs. Um, so if, if we go the construction manager at risk route, we're hoping for early summer. Um, it really depends on how this process goes on getting all these contracts awarded through the selection process. And then if we go a design bid build, probably tack on an extra two or three months to that just because it takes longer for the bid um, process where you have to be at 100% bid documents before you can put it out on the street. Um, and get questions back and, and really with that type of um, delivery you're getting that input from the contractors after you're at 100% completion so there's times when there's questions that come up and so during that bid phase you're, you're making some redesigns and some tweaks and some changes and all of that gets incorporated into the bid as well. So uh, over the past couple of months I've received some different questions and the Westwood Hills Neighborhood Association was kind enough to submit some questions that I just want to, to be able to address because um, maybe they're uh, throughout the neighborhood association or maybe there's some of your concerns uh, as well. So uh, talk a little bit about what would happen to the area north of the police headquarters, um, which is what Director Rogers talked about, and uh, we can continue to talk about that a little more. I'm going to open up for question and answer and then also individual. But the important thing there, I think, is that um, the entire site is not getting rezoned to general public use. Um, there will be, still be a significant portion that is part. Uh, one of the comments that I, that I have heard uh, is that many people may have purchased a home uh, thinking about the park. I know that at one time the, the entire lot was um, for park. And uh, uh, Assistant Director Ice can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my understanding is that that was uh, originally intent for what we now know as like the Rock Chuck Park Sports Pavilion Awards area, large gyms, um, so also traffic issues, things like that. Um, and then uh, once that was built later on, and maybe you want to speak, you can speak to it more intelligently that I, maybe once that was built later on, that was no longer the intended use. So there's no need to duplicate the sports pavilion more a mile or two down the road. Uh, and if you have questions about that, uh, uh, Assistant Director I see or Doug Rogers can also answer, answer some of those things for you. Uh, as I've been asked about a traffic plan being designed, and that will not be done until we hit the um, schematic all those planning submittals, so as we're going through the site plan and the special use permit, all that requires a traffic study. So and that, that's one of those excellent opportunities to, to give input and then also to see how there might be uh, an effect. I would say this, and though I can't tell you I'm not a traffic engineer, um, but I know some of the concern is we have Free State High. Free State High has a tremendous amount of traffic around 8 a.m. They have a tremendous amount of traffic uh, around 3 p.m. So the majority of our employees work in the patrol division. And uh, so our patrol arrives 
somewhere around 6.45 or so, and then they go out to their shift about 7.15, and the other, the night shift would come in. And then the other times that they do that is around 10.45, 11. Um, and then, um, so the crew comes on at 4.45, excuse me, 5 o'clock, so they'd be there about 4.45 or so. Um, and then we have a crew that comes on at night. So um, that being said, that's like eight cars. Um, so there's not, if you, if you have ever come around the police station or if you want to come sit at the investigation training center uh, or, or go to a local police station, I don't know um, if our 111 East 11th is representative because there's a large amount of court traffic. If you go there on the weekend to see how much traffic there is, there's actually not that tra much traffic to a police department. We go out to, uh, for a large portion of the calls. Um, though some people do certainly come to the police station, but um, as we talk about the eight to cars that are coming in for a particular shift at a time, uh, compared to the thousand cars that are coming in and also the neighborhoods, and we're talking about a really, really uh, small number. So um, I certainly understand some of the concern there, um, and a traffic study will ultimately bear it out, but you're not talking about a large amount of cars, um, especially during the times that are also peak in your neighborhood. But that's not necessarily our peak. Uh, I was asked a question about uh, Queens Road, and, I, and I, uh, admittedly I didn't know a lot about this topic. I had to revisit a city commission meeting, and uh, it seems like it's been uh, quite the topic. It maybe even scared me a little bit watching that commission meeting. Uh, but uh, I did talk to Director uh, Chuck Souls of Public Works today, and he said that this property is not in the benefit district. Um, so uh, it is outside that. And, uh, um, I, I apologize because I don't know, I don't have a great deal of in-depth knowledge about that. I, I uh, got some of these questions and I tried to learn on the fly uh, late last night and, and early today, but I hope to learn more uh, soon. So I, I reached out to, to the expert there. Um, as you look at some of the sheets here, one of the questions that I got really early on in the process or concerned certainly with the neighborhood is like a jail or port type facilities and there's no plan for either of those types of facilities. The jail is done by the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Um, and municipal court, um, from my understanding, is having some plans to move into 66th Street. Um, and so it's not, it's not a situation where you have a large amount of people who may be getting out of a criminal process uh, that, would, that would be wandering the neighborhood. And typically, unless they otherwise want to, even if we were to interview someone, we'd take them back to wherever they would like to go. Or sometimes they can do it without the privilege. So, um, those are some of the questions that I had here, um, and I just wanted to answer those because I'm sure some people uh, who weren't even able to attend uh, would like to have them, and, and we will uh, get a video up on the city's website here in the next couple of weeks, um, and we'll continue to have these kind of public meetings. As you can see, this is a long process, and there's a lot of places where there needs to be public input, and like Dr. Director Rogers talked about, where, where we really want your, your input, um, whether you live near the area, whether you have Association of Reese High, or just as a citizen of Lawrence. Um, it's certainly important to have all those viewpoints and, and for us to understand what's going on uh, and what your concerns are so we can either uh, address them or fix them or, or work together just to find solutions. So I'd like to open it up to any questions for anybody on the panel. Sorry, I saw your answers. Hi, my name is Neil Beamer. I live on um, the Everest Circle, and actually, my question is. We have two little ones, and there are lots of you know little folks in our neighborhood, and we're really interested in um, in the park facilities. Um, we also have a grandma who lives on the next block, and so not only interested in park and recreation for little people, but also multi generational. Okay. Um, I know my mom, for instance, would love a place to go and walk outside, um, and so any sort of when are you going to be taking inputs um, for recreation, and how will that be sorted out? Take inputs obviously at any time. That that's good. And what I really need to see is how the the layout of the, uh, the place land is going to be in the building to see how the parks are going to interact. But uh, the feedback I have gotten has been mainly uh, trail oriented, whether it be ADA or walking, uh, and then looking for fitness. And it's nice to have the input on. It, it sounds like playground equipment definitely have, have need to be in there. Uh, sort of on all of the in the immediate area, and there's little parallel plots of houses. Where, I, I live in, I live over by Colorado, I'm trying to think, where is your house in relation to this property, and where you live in there? So we're off of Locker versus Angel. Okay. Okay, so pretty close. 
super close. We probably would build it and throw a stone into the locker room. <laughs> With the, the park, one of the things that we see just it's, it, it's coming to our attention now is because of all the traffic that's going on at Free State High School and then the aquatic center and then the issues with parking. And so maybe we can have that conversation with the school district about what if we had an access offered walking Rusa. Just thrown out there, not saying it's going to happen, but if we did, could we tie that into maybe the Free State property, maybe they could have parking there and alleviate some of the issues that we're having with traffic. But uh, after this meeting, I'll give you my card. And, sure. Uh, we'll get some information. That would be we'll great. I think that folks just want, don't want to be sort of left behind on the planning process, and then the next thing you know, we end up with a parks and recreation piece that no one is really all that happy about. Um, and so I think that there are lots of ways to do it, and I think that there are probably lots of people who want to give voice to that. So if we had an idea of how to involve ourselves in the process and when the meetings would actually be, that would be really helpful. We'll, we'll get some public forums going and try to get some neighborhood input to get that And I'd, I'd like to add that we're going to have a website for the police facility project, but uh, we would welcome comments associated with the park as well as we're going through the site plan. So uh, we'll have forms on there that can be filled out just with comments or requests for amenities, any of that type of thing. And as we get further along, I could see, you know, surveys and things like that being put out there. Like if you had a choice of these type of amenities, rank them, that type of thing. One of the things we're looking at, instead of having, say, the police department use an architect and then parks and recreation go out and get an architect, can we piggyback and save some money in the city and combine that at one time so we can the integration of the two of them and better. So. And I think the nicer that you make sort of the outdoor um, gardens of the facility will make it feel more sort of community policing, which I know is something the police department has talked about. But certainly, I mean, it would be nice to have police officers interacting sort of at the park equipment with people who Absolutely. live around this area. And so, you know, ideally, it would be a place where people of all different ages would be interested through the exercise, sort of exercising and leisure. So one thing I do want you to know is that this the process is going to be a very public process. Like we talked about the camera meeting here, this won't be our only community meeting. We certainly will probably have one specifically to the parks and, and then all the different processes. We're going, to, we're going to put it out there as much as possible. And we want feedback. We want to know what fits and what works um, for not only the community around here, but also, also the city. Which, uh, so do you have a question? Um, I'm sorry. I think I'm sorry. I'm Anthony Brooks. This is some capital police department. Anthony Brixius. Oh, okay. Right. I apologize if I didn't draw it. Um, I had a question about the, in these uh, various phases, uh, if officers have to bring in witnesses or suspects for uh, interviews, mm -hmm. where would that be done? So as far as like where would they where would they interview them? Yeah. So they would interview them in an interview room within the police station. Uh, that occurs right now both at uh, 4820 Bob Buildings and at 111 East 11. Um, so usually the, it's some type of interview that's recorded and things of that nature, and you interview in pairs, and then you also have uh, many times people who are watching the interviews. So uh, is the concern about bringing people uh, into the neighborhood? Is that my no? Okay. It's a, a, about having uh, uh, the proper process, so you don't have the witness over here listening in. To okay. The, uh, yeah. Okay. So. You just have to keep those things uh, segregated. I, I absolutely agree. So one of the biggest problems we have right now is that uh, you can literally hear from room to room. There's nowhere for a victim uh, to necessarily be separated uh, from a suspect as we walk in. Uh, Ms. Harger and I, we've taken several tour, tours of new police facilities. Um, and so you see, you know, you feel like maybe you have deficiencies before, but then you see the nuances later of, of how, what your deficiencies really are. Um, and so certainly um, seeing some of those things and talking with um, architects who are police uh, oriented of design, design police facilities. And that's what Ms. Harder talked about, that the professional services aren't necessarily 
just based on cost. They're based on what has that professional service done before and, and how can they provide value in a situation just like you're talking about. Yes, sir. That's two questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Ackerley, I live in Westwood Village um, on North Eaton Drive, right off of Lighting House. First question has to do with the timeline, just to make sure I understand it correctly. If everything fell into place like you wanted it to, then all the elements you have listed under priority one and two in phase one would be completed by September of 2020. That would be great. However, we don't anticipate with our budget being able to get everything in the priority two uh, list. But yes, all of phase one would be complete by September of 2020. And the, the hope is with having a contractor's input as well and everyone knowing from the beginning what our budget is, this is the max price we can spend, how many of these things can we get? These are must-haves and the other is, you know, how much can we get in phase one because it's going to cost a lot more later when it's in phase two. Okay. And the second question has to do with the park. I'm sure Parks and Rec will have a parallel phase timeline for the development of the park. But from an end state, when would you expect to have a park up and running and completed in relationship to the LA city? I would same expect time afterwards? I'd, I'd expect about the same time or sometime after. Mm -hmm. it, it just Parks are expensive, especially if you start putting down equipment, fitness equipment, trails, somewhat. As if you're laying asphalt, um, there's a cost involved and significant. So I'm thinking probably 2020, 2021. But ideally, pretty much at the same time. That's my goal. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Yes. In under the biggest possibilities, in the column of the block that says mental health. Uh huh. What does that refer to? That, that refers to our mental health team. So a couple of years ago, the city um, added uh, a police officer, a supervisor, and a Burton Ash co-responder. Um, and it's a unit. It's just like the school resource officers, and they deal with um, individuals who may be having reoccurring mental health issues. It's not we're not bringing mental health patients or anything like that to it, um, as far as like residing there or anything like that. It's just the unit that actually um, works on most of those. I saw another hand, but I forgot where it was. I'm, yes, I'm Steve Johnson. I live in the West Wales, 356 North um, I have several several concerns. I don't know always when to bring these up. I'm sure. to start now because we should continue. Uh, one is the whole issue of traffic. Mm -hmm. um, not just because of the school, and not just because you're a police department, but it's all going to come into play here with all the construction and everything that's going on to the west of of Queens Road, uh -huh. uh, whether it be Rock Chop Park or the new L and H facility, or all the homes that are being built there, the thousand apartments that are being built there, there's going to be a lot of traffic that's going to want to use all over the drive, which will go right by the police department's entrance if, if this stays the way it is. Mm -hmm. There may be traffic that a lot of traffic that wants to come up Rock Rusa to Sixth Street, which causes a whole lot of issues with the school as well as Sixth and Rock Rusa. So when people run into an issue with uh, traffic in that area, they're going to look for places to get away from that. So they're going to use Overland Drive. They're going to use whatever Queens Road turns out to be. Mm -hmm. And then the whole traffic issue exacerbates itself on top of all the other things that are going on with the police moving in and out of there. Mm -hmm. So and I know you mentioned only eight cars at a time, but I don't know how many employees are going to be there actually. Sure. Um, so, not being a traffic engineer, I, I couldn't even give you what would be close to a reasonable answer. No, I think the many things that you talked about, though, have much more significant effect than the amount of police presence that there is. If we talk about the number of people that are running through there, uh, probably it's sometimes tenfold when you talk about a hospital, when you talk about things that are already existing. Um, but it will be important um, to have your input and everybody else do, as we do part of the traffic study. So, but we can't get to that point until we say, uh, this is potentially where the building could be. This is potentially where the entrances could be. And then, well, let me correct if I'm wrong, but that's the point where the traffic safety. Yeah, once we figure out the entrances and, and we know the, uh, the footprint of the building, and the use of the building, obviously we're aware of that, but all that goes into the traffic study. I would think the entrances would have something to do with the traffic, but be that as it may. 
Also, are all the monies set aside for the police facility right this minute? Have they been approved? Yes. Seventeen million dollars. Yes. Uh, One point five million uh, in the previous CIP, the twenty seventeen CIP, and then seventeen million for, for a total of eighteen. Has any money been approved for the park? Yeah, we have it in our uh, capital improvement project list for twenty twenty. I believe two hundred thousand dollars. We had a little bit of money, so maybe just we put more money at it at a time. We just continue to build it. Well, I do know there's a priority list made for those improvements, and yep. we would like to be at the top of the priority list, but there are a lot of other people in town that have other issues or concerns. But, um, and the other thing about design, I guess, more than anything else, is is, is it going to be a one or two story building? Uh, would it be burned and, and landscapes where you can't really see it if you glance over there, you really don't know it's there? I mean. Those type of things. Sure. And would it be fenced? Would the whole facility be fenced? The facility would be uh, fenced in some way or a secure parking lot. And then when you mention here a outbuilding for large vehicles, what is a large vehicle and how big of an outbuilding is that? Uh, so for example, we have um, crime scene vehicles. So um, currently they're stored at Stone Barn, are you familiar with that? Uh, yes. so, uh, so, um, most of our large vehicles are, are stored there. So they're the equivalent, the ones that are there right now are equivalent to like F450s and F550s. So they're not like extremely large, but they're bigger than the regular size of the so. And there would be no thought to have some something the size of, a, of a, uh, an army vehicle that they use for swatting like MRAP and things like that. We, we don't have an MRAP. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have an F450 or F550, I can't remember which one, but uh, it's painted white and it does have um, some armor repelling capabilities, but it's not military issued. It's it's not an MRAP. It doesn't do the same kind of things. So you wouldn't be planning to put in a type of vehicle like that or a no, that, that, of that. That, that, would, that? that could certainly be part of it because uh, we don't expect to be able to be in Stone Farm very long, uh, but uh, it would be in some sort of security cover. And how many employees will be housed there today? We do not know until we know uh, what can go into the city. So as you, as you see, uh, so there's a approximately 90 or so that are on patrol. To understand how our patrol works, uh, half work half of the week, half work half the other half of the week. So you're splitting that in half, and then you're splitting it into four sections um, after you split it in half. Um, and so the time of day would very much depend. Obviously, during the, um, a uh, three o'clock hour, there's going to be more people because you're potentially going to have civilian employees, um, depending on what the uh, in process is for what units go in there and you guys are adding uh, employees. So we have 154 commissioned officers. We have about 180, I'm losing my thought process, 186 or so employees. Um, but as we talked about, half work one day, half work the other day, um, and then there's varying times where people work. And how many people are staying? at the and, other facility for phase, phase two would have eventually all of them, but phase one is what percentage of that, two thirds? It, yeah, it really depends on, on what is in there, but a training unit, which is a, a significant part of our uh, traffic, as far as like potentially like if we have a day of training, that, that could be the most uh, significant traffic that I can really think of. We have a day of training with multiple people coming in there. That is staying at 40 to 20 mile buildings. So if you proceed with it. Would there be uh, there evidently, you talk about 24-7 access, in and out, egress and ingress, 24-7. Yes. So that would require a lot of lighting. Would there be a lot of, would the whole place be lit up like the Free State football field? There's lighting requirements as part of the site plan. Um, it limits how much light can go within a certain uh, distance of your perimeter. So uh, most of the lighting and parking lots are downlit. And it, the, the goal is to not have anything escape the site in terms of the light spread. So there's lighting calculations that go into that site. Is that how the Free State football field is yeah. not? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you're talking about adding or perhaps a, another cut on Walker Vista for Free State. Uh, I think Director Rogers was talking about that. that was <laughs> I think that was speculation. <laughs> possibility, just for the back part. Okay, number one, it's 45,000 dollars Number two, there's a hill. Number three, if there's any left-hand turns 
I'm just brainstorming because I'm looking at all the problems we've got. Right. Well, well, you know, at this point, Walker Reason comes down and the apartment's over here, and there's a do not make a legal U turn, and they do it all day long. Now they would be so doing right. it right in front of the police station. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have cameras aimed at the intersection. The police are going to be up here. These things are down here. Yeah. And it's, it's constant. They pay no attention. I don't even know why we have it. Um, I would I would be surprised if the public entrance co comes off of that. The public entrance to the uh, police facility would most likely come off of Overland. Oh, okay. Speaking of entrances, uh, there's a there are there is a whole road over here in the north northwest of the park and also northwest of the police station called Eisenhower, which runs up and down uh, that edge of the park. Um, but then you're then, then you're causing a lot of traffic more than likely to end up on Eisenhower in the middle of the neighborhood. But but if the park is developed in any way, shape, or form, I would imagine there's going to be some kind of ingress and egress to the park on Eisenhower. That would there would be potential for that because again, fire would probably say they'd like another entrance if possible, depending on how it's laid out. Yeah. There could possibly be a neighborhood entrance there. Yeah. Or, well, neighborhood entrances turn into a well-used traffic way if we're not careful. I mean, it's, yeah. there's a fine line to walk. Mm -hmm. This uh, This is, I guess, not specifically related, but I'm, I'm wondering about the, the location here, uh, Morris is becoming a very spread out town. Mm -hmm. And it takes two days by wagon to get from here to the southeast uh, boundary of Morris. Mm -hmm. um, is there any thought of, in the future, establishing a substation in southeast Morris? substation in the former mall up by the turnpike and maybe a substation in the storefront downtown and some work with the university police maybe to uh, have a, a sort of a permanent presence in the KU uh, Student Wildlife Refuge, which, which is the oriented neighborhood. Right. Uh, 
but it's it seems like the you know I know each officer has so much electronics and and things in their cars that their their communication is always very good. So we're certainly growing and we're right around that 100,000 mark. And one of the things that was uh, looked at when this study was done is at what point do you start to need multiple precincts? And that typically is around your 200, and I'm going off the top of my head, but I think 200, 250,000, um, bit, I'm sorry, about 200. About 200. So we, while we are certainly growing and while we are spreading out, we're, we're not uh, really close to the point where you do that. One of the biggest issues with that is you are duplicating many, many things, um, and so you're duplicating costs in many, in many circumstances. Well, I, I have another question. Sure. The, the other day, I uh, turned on the, the Kansas City television station, and uh, they had their uh, helicopter up in the air, and they were tracking a uh, chase, a police chase of a fugitive. And it was really good TV. I, I liked it a lot. Uh, but the guy put a lot of people at risk. And this went on for 40 minutes, which was really good because there were no commercial interruptions. And I was wondering if Lawrence Police Department is of the size where they need a, a, an aerial surveillance, old oh, privacy, privacy, but an aerial surveillance in their own to, uh, you know, maybe uh, help out in, in those instances where somebody's on the run. Sure. Uh, let's do this. If you want to talk about that, we'll talk about everything. But I think a lot of people here are, are for the building. We certainly are not up a size for needing a helicopter. I, I, I can answer that fairly easily for you. <laughs> Yes, if you think a building is expensive, get a helicopter. There's no plan for a helicopter, <laughs> No, those, those things are very expensive. I came from a police department where we had a helicopter, and those are very expensive to operate. Now, if we really need one, we've got the state police that we can call, and we can also call Topeka if we really need one. Uh, don't see many uh, questions. Feel free to come up and ask us individual questions if maybe you didn't want to ask a question in a in much of a public forum. I will tell you this microphone's on, so if you don't if you don't want to ask a question there, uh, ask one of us to come over and talk to you, whatever the case may be. But, uh, if there's not any other questions for the group, I, I do truly appreciate you coming and taking the time to uh, talk to us, to ask your questions, to get the concerns out there. And uh, I, I think there's some legitimate um, things that people are talking about, whether it's traffic, um, whether it's interests, whether it's our safety, um, whether it's the park. And so I hope to see you all as part of this process going forward and at the public meetings and, and certainly giving the input uh, just like you're giving tonight. Thank you very much.